Very warm welcome to you this Sunday morning with the beautiful weather, although a little cold, but uh, that we love it when it's crisp. Um, welcome everybody. Do come and, and take your seats, um, particularly towards the, the front. Uh, there are slightly fewer of us this morning, I think, because of the holidays. But we are here to worship the Lord, and he is here to meet with us. And so we're going to pray, we're going to praise during this meeting, we are going to uh, focus our hearts and our minds on the Lord. Um, we're welcoming in a, a team from London City Mission that are just going to be um, doing some filming this morning. Um, there is no worry about that if you are concerned that you don't want to appear in that uh, little documentary they're doing on their work, then just have a word with us afterwards and we will have, we have a, a right to review all of that, so we'll make sure that you're not in it. Um, but we're delighted that they're with us. And um, isn't, it, isn't it good just to be here? Let's stand before we worship and as we praise and pray and give ourselves to God, uh, let's stand together. Lord, we thank you that your family is a multicolored, multi-generational, multicultural family. You call men and women, old and young, from every corner of the world to worship you. And as we step into your presence this morning, we bring our lives and we lay them at your feet. We ask, Lord, that you would inspire our singing would you inspire our prayers? Would you open our ears and our hearts that we might meet with you? Please come, Lord, and be the center of our worship today. Thank you that you are so faithful that all around us, day after day, you are performing miracles, doing uh, amazing things. And so we set our hearts on worship now, and we praise your name. Amen. Let's rejoice together.
unshaken boy, hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshaken boy, hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. conquered the grave you freed every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awakened in life oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great Psalm 126 says this, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Look at you, some of you sitting down. That's incredible. How, how is this possible? We're doing great things. I mean, the Lord has done great things, and we are rejoicing in those great... You can sit down if you want. Um, it's all right. So long as in your hearts you're standing up and you're moving around. Sophie, we've got something with wildlife, but just show us rejoicing about great things. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks That's like. That's what it looks like. It looks like an octopus. <laughs> Do that just once again, please. Maybe, hang a second. Are there any children in, in octopus? Yeah? All right, Ready? Can you stand up? Can you do it with me? We're going to show the adults how to rejoice like an octopus. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Woo. All right. It's good. It's good. Can I have, can I have um, the adults' full attention? I'm afraid we have to outdo the children. We're going to try and rejoice like an octopus. All right? You can try. How, just show us again how we do this. You've got to get your feet going as well, because otherwise, otherwise you're not an octopus. I want everybody to imitate Vera. <laughs> let's do it. We're, let's rejoice like an octopus. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> All right, that, good. that is not bad. Um, Sophie, Sophie. Um, Focusing in. Come on, we've got to move on here because it's, re it's written down, rejoice like an octopus. Uh, yeah, yeah, you okay. did that tick. Um, we've got wildlife this morning. We've got wildlife this morning. We're looking at the prodigal son. And in church, we're looking at the prodigal son as well. And the end of the prodigal son focuses on rejoicing. And so that is our theme. We want to rejoice in all the good things Absolutely. that God has done. Exactly, because God always wants to rejoice in us. So should we pray before the children Sounds leave good. us and we continue in our worship? Lord, we thank you that you are the God of joy. We thank you that even in the most difficult circumstances, we can turn our hearts and our faces to you and you change our lives. You are the God who saves. You are the God who meets us in our deepest pain, in our deepest need. And you come and you rescue us. Salvation, Lord, comes from you. And this morning we ask you would fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit joy and trust. We pray for the children as they go that rejoicing will accompany them. And we pray that you will be glorified in all we do. Amen. 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 Can, I, can I have everyone freeze, though, for a second, just in case? I've already been doing a head count, and I have a sneaking suspicion that my little lions might need extra help. Okay. So if I have to run back up, if you see me again, I might need extra help with my little two- to three-year-olds. Okay, so any lion tamers in the room? Yeah. <laughs> if you want to help, then uh, that's great. Any parents from that age group who are willing to take some time to help, that would be fantastic. The children are going to leave us. We're going to continue to focus on the Lord and give him everything, for he is worthy of our praise. So let's rejoice in him.
let's just focus our hearts back on him. Jesus, we are here for you.
until the day you come I will sing of what you've done that through my life your kingdom's breaking out holy and holy is the Father holy is the Son holy is the Spirit my God is the
We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has already entered on our behalf. Lord, we thank you that you are the rock. In our troubled lives, we turn to you and you speak words of peace. We turn to you and you speak words of love. Like a potter, you take our lives and you remould them. You refashion them. Like an expert painter, you draw beauty on the canvas of our lives. Like a poet, you sing over us. As we turn to you, our lives are illumined. Our lives are changed. We thank you, Lord, that as we worship you, so we join the worship of heaven, singing holy. Thank you, Lord. We're going to join together in the words of the confession, which are an invitation for us to step into God's presence just as we are and receive the forgiveness that he promises. As we stand, let's say together these words. Heavenly Father, we confess that we have done what is wrong in your sight and have not loved you as well as we could. We are sorry and ask for your forgiveness. Have mercy on us because of your great love. Wash away all the wrong we have done and make us clean on the inside. Pour into our hearts again the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, and make our joy like that on the day we first truly believed. May Almighty God cleanse us from our sins and restore in us the image of our Lord Jesus Christ to the praise and the glory of his name. Amen. We're going to continue in prayer. If you'd like to sit, thank you to the band for leading us into the Lord's presence. And as we come so we can bring our joys and also our burdens to the Lord. Today we continue in this sermon series on parables and we're looking at the parable of the prodigal son as um, we join also with the children who are looking at it downstairs. And this is one of the most familiar parables and yet what a beautiful image of God's grace. But as we pray now, we're aware that in many ways um, our world is like that prodigal son. In pain, hurting, there are situations and people. Sometimes it's through direct fault. Sometimes it's through the fault of another. Let's call on God our Father who loves his world, to come. Let's pray. (coughs) 
Gracious Heavenly Father, as we turn on the news, as we read the papers, as we look at our social media feed, as we reflect on everything going around us, we are aware, aware O oh Lord, that in so many ways the world you created has turned its back on you with disastrous consequences. We, Lord, are a prodigal world. We need your help. And so as your people this morning, we want to pray. We want to pray for all those who are suffering mental, physical anguish at this time, perhaps loneliness, much like the prodigal son. Those we know who are suffering the pain of loss, who have a wrong image of themselves. Those who don't turn to you because they have a wrong image of you. And yet you are the loving Father who waits and calls and seeks. Today we want to pray into the pain of Ukraine and we pray for those who are weeping, those who are affected by this tragic war. We pray for Ukrainians who are displaced. We also pray for Russians who, through no fault of their own, are suffering the effects of this war. We pray, Lord, for those who are caught up in battle and did not know where they were sent or why. We pray for churches today in those war torn lands, that you would give courage to those who bring your word, that they might speak hope. We pray for those that we know in our land who are still suffering the consequences of isolation and mental uh, stress after covid or who are suffering for any number of reasons. And as we pray, Lord, we think of people that we know who need you to come close today. Would you seek them out, please, Lord? You are the God who seeks and saves the lost. You are always active, always there. We pray for your loving arms to surround them. We pray for ourselves, Lord, as we come to listen to this passage, this familiar parable, that you would open our minds and our hearts afresh. Give us humility, Lord. Lead us to repentance. Forgive our pride, our autonomy. We too often, Lord, close the door to your love. Please give us soft hearts, Lord, today. Spiritual ears opened and spiritual minds alive we want to hear you speak Lord our confidence is in you you are our father and so we pray with the words that Jesus taught his disciples saying our father Let's say that again. Our Father in heaven. 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we're going to turn to the word now. We're going to listen to this amazing parable of the prodigal son, which Richard, I think, is going to read to us. I love it when I... Richard, that's good. Thank you. That's a sign of that I got your name right and the right person. We're going to read from uh, Luke's gospel and then Pippa's going to speak to us. Um, Let's listen. Thank you, Andy. If you wish to follow in the church Bible, you can find it on page uh, 1049. Again, I'm starting from verse 11 through to the end of the chapter 15. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put on him. Put a finger on his finger and saddles on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes and comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost 
and is found. Well, good. Oh, am I on? I am? Uh, good morning. Um, as Richard has just read to us, um, we're looking at the parable of perhaps the most well-loved and best known of them all. So let us pray uh, to ask for God's help as we study it. Heavenly Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to inspire and awaken all of our senses as we uh, study this uh, passage together. Father God, I pray that you would give us open hearts and minds. Lord, that you would show something fresh to each one of us in whatever uh, area that we needed in our lives. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth will not only bring blessing, but will bring glory to you. And I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, when you've been a Christian for many years, as I have, it is in some way more of a challenge to find something fresh and meaningful in the parables. This particular one is equally challenging for the preacher who is trying to find that little nugget of gold for the congregation sat before them. Added to which, parables are uniquely difficult to interpret, partly because the context with which Jesus was telling them doesn't sit quite so easily for us in the 21st century. But that doesn't mean that we don't try. The most well-known interpretation of the parable of the lost son is that we, you and I, are either represented by the two sons and God is represented by the father. There are certainly aspects of this which are true, but it may not be helpful if your experience of a father, or a mother for that matter, is anything other than loving and generous. We do not know why the son demands his portion of the inheritance. One has to clearly consider, therefore, that there are tensions within the family. And for the audience listening to the parable, it would also be very clear that the son who demands his portion of the inheritance is, in effect, wishing that his father were dead. The underlying culture of honor and shame is completely and utterly trashed by this apparent simple request for his portion. In fact, it is not just shocking, it is scandalous. The theologian Paula Gooder also highlights another difficulty, that is in associating the Father with God. She says those who see the Father as God argue that the father acted out of love for the younger son. Those who don't see the father as God question whether the father's action was in fact loving, suggesting that it might be better seen as indulgent. But we have to remember that teaching of Jesus, which you find in Matthew 7, about... Do you want me to switch it's not on. It's not on. Oh, oh. I hate technology. I'm a dinosaur, really. Um, the passage in Matthew 7, where it's, Jesus talks about asking, seeking, and knocking, and which he says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Well, one of the other challenges of the parable is that under Jewish law, the father's estates simply cannot be split 
the elder son is entitled to two-thirds of the estate and the younger son the other third. And by giving the younger son his inheritance, the father is in fact forcing the elder son to also take his part of the inheritance as well. And this creates a difficulty for us because the subsequent party to celebrate the lost son being found is in effect taking or using what is now the elder son's property. That doesn't sound like a loving father to me. So we can see there are various challenges in how we can interpret this parable. But please hear this. I am not saying that one view is right and the other is not you are going to have to think about it and work it out for yourself. But let's get back onto more familiar territory. Last week, Andy spoke about the lost sheep and the lost coin. And today we focus our attention on the third of the lost and found parables, the lost son. Clearly, Luke, in putting three lost and found parables next to each other, wants the reader to understand something important on the subject of losing and finding. We've all had those moments, haven't we, when we've lost things like keys or jewellery, like the lost coin. I've lost this signet ring, I don't know if you can see it, uh, on more than one occasion, and oh, the relief when I have found it. Several years ago, Roz, my sister, and I took our niece and nephew to Legoland, there was an awful moment when we realized that Will had wandered off a bit like the sheep. Well, we did find him literally moments later, but it felt like a lifetime. And it still ranks as one of the most stressful moments in my life to date. And I don't want too many of those experiences. Thank you very much. And in the first, of the two, the first two lost and found parables, the coin was simply misplaced and the sheep had wandered off. Yet here, the younger son makes a deliberate choice to leave. I want us to pick up the story at the point where the lost son has squandered his wealth in wild living and as a result of a severe famine, finds himself in need. We learn that he ends up feeding the pigs and if that weren't insult enough, he was so hungry that he longed to fill his stomach with the very pods that he was feeding to the pigs. But he comes to his, uh, his senses and he realizes that his father's hired servants were better off than he was. In this respect, the lost son found himself. This coming to his senses is not simply a self-preservation response although that is part of it. There is something much deeper going on here. Biologically, he will always be his father's son, but in the complexity of human love and relationships, the son is still connected at an emotional, intellectual and spiritual level to his father. He belongs to someone. He is part of a family. It is these connections that are driving his return home. Henry Nouwen, in his wonderful book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, a story of homecoming, comments that the, home, the journey home for the lost son will be long and arduous. Because, of course, making a decision is one thing, but acting on it is quite another. We know that the lost son was in a foreign land with no money. So the journey home would literally be long and arduous. But the journey home wasn't just physically demanding and arduous. It was mentally for him. When we are unsure of how people will respond to us, especially if we feel ashamed and embarrassed, we play out various scenarios in our mind. We play out various arguments in the hope of justifying and obtaining the acceptance and love we so badly want or need. In the case of the lost son, he acknowledges he is his father's son, but decides that he can no longer enjoy this status 
because of his earlier behavior. He is looking to save face in the hope that his father will employ him as one of his hired hands. His repentance becomes a form of self-preservation. The tragi- tragedy is that the shame and embarrassment the son feels colors his perspective of his father and it is perpetuating the error of judgment he made in demanding his inheritance that he thinks he knows best. If we assume the father in the story represents God, the lost son's repentance portrays God as someone who is harsh and judgmental. And therein lies one of the most difficult things for all of us at some stage in our life. We are embarrassed and ashamed of some of the things we have said and done, and we want to wallow in our squalid messes, whether of our own making or because someone has backed us into it, believing that our situation is beyond the reach of a loving God. We seem to want to settle with being a hired hand rather than a son or daughter. Whatever the thinking and wrestling in the mind of the lost son, he makes a choice, a choice to return to what he knows will be infinitely better than where he is now, even as a hired hand. Then something remarkable happens. We read in verse 20 that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. In this moment, the son experiences the overwhelming love of his father and the power of forgiveness. Two things that cannot be earned because they are given and received. Yet it seems as though the son still can't quite fully comprehend what is going on, and immediately goes on into his well-rehearsed speech about him not being worthy to be called his son. There is a warning here to be careful how we think about ourselves. Rehearsing self-preservation scenarios in our mind may end up blinding us to see the reality of the truth before us. The truth that is summed up so beautifully in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That is worth celebrating. And celebration is an overlooked but constant theme running through all three of the lost and found parables. Rejoice with me, cries the shepherd, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Rejoice with me, cries the woman, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Let's have a feast and celebrate, cries the father, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Well, let me try to explain why this theme of celebration is key. Right at the beginning of chapter 15, Luke sets the scene for the context of these three parables. Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners, something the Pharisees and scribes are grumbling about. As Jesus tells the parables, he is explaining to them his whole kingdom mission. These parables show us that all of us have the potential to be lost in different ways, but we are also found in different ways. The parties, the celebrations represent God's joyous welcome of every kind of person into his family. The only entry requirement is humility and repentance. I want to end with a testimony of my own about the sense of being called to return. In May last year, I did three days of praying and fasting. I've never done anything as long as that before. I've missed a meal here and and stopped having coffee during the day, those sorts of things. But I think I never 
fully expected to be able to hear God and how he spoke to me and brought things to mind. And I had a few days um, previous to that time read that wonderful passage in 1 Kings uh, about Elijah being in a cave. He had, remember, he had done battle with 400 prophets of Baal and Jezebel was after him for his life for what he had achieved over the, um, the prophets of Baal. And he's in a cave and he's kind of licking his wounds a bit and he asks to see God face to face. And Elijah um, is told by God that he cannot see God literally face to face. He wouldn't survive. But he, uh, God passes by in the wind and the fire. But actually the moment of connection is in the stillness, in the quietness, in that still, small voice. And Elijah hears God say to him, go back the way you came. And for me... God really spoke powerfully with that, and, um, and this is why. Because about 20-odd years ago, I started the process to consider, look at ordination. And it was a really difficult time to go through, and for various reasons, uh, I put a, an end to it, and I'm happy to talk to you about that over a cup of coffee if you'd like, really like to hear that, sorry. But um, I... Because I had been so hurt through the whole process, I had just thought I was never going to go there again. And God was clearly saying to me, Pippa, go back the way you came. And so I stand before you, many of you know, but many of you don't know, that I am currently in that process of discernment for ordination. And um, I have no idea whether this um, exploration and the call to ordain ministry will end in a celebration But that does not matter, because this I do know. The God I believe in loves me, and he loves you. And he is more than able to redeem and restore us. The big question is, will we let him? Because if we do, the transformation will be worth celebrating. Amen. Thank you, Pippa, for that uh, thought-provoking um, message. We're going to respond. Um, we're going to begin by responding with uh, a song of worship. And um, let's see this as an opportunity for us to, um, to hear that voice of the Father calling us home, Um, that place of celebration is a homecoming in many ways for each of us, and we're called to be like that son who sees the need and has the humility to turn around and come back, and um, many of us, as Pippa said, may have heard this parable many, many times. Some of us may have heard it for the very first time, but what an amazing picture we have of a God who um, is there loving us, wooing us, drawing us in. And so as we sing this song, perhaps we can stay seated for it. Let's just um, make this into a moment where we actually say to the Lord, yes, I'm, I'm coming home today. I'm responding. I want afresh to sense that love uh, welcoming me so that I can hear the sound of celebration and join in what you have. And uh, for each of us, that will be different. But the great thing is that, of course, we're, we're all called. So let's um, just allow the Lord who calls us, that Father um, who calls his Son, let's um, respond, each of us in our hearts, saying, yes, yes, Lord, um, I'm coming. Let's uh, 
respond in prayer and worship.
us to do something really um, unusual, if that's all right. In silence, I'm just going to ask you to move somewhere different. Staying standing, just to move somewhere different. Could you do that? To move to a different space in the building. It doesn't matter whether there's a chair there or not. Just Could you just move? And if inside yourself you're saying, I don't like this, that's fine. You don't have to move. Move in your heart. <laughs> I love it. Aaron and Kathy, they moved and then they moved back. That's perfect. Okay, here's the thing, friends. This is all about the young man moving. The word repentance in Greek means a change of place, a change of direction, a change of mindset. It's the word conversion, it's a turning, it's a moving word. And today we're saying to the Lord, would you move me somewhere new? Would you help me to see you in a new way? Would you help me to hear you in a new way? Sense your love in a fresh way. We do not want, Lord, to stay the same in your presence. We hear your word and we need your spirit to bring it alive in our lives. We know, Lord, we need your help. We know we need you to save us from so many things. Turn us around, Lord. Turn us upside down. Shake us. And give us a glimpse of the rejoicing that is in your heart whenever we turn to you.
Thank you. Um, we're not quite finished. We've just got one more thing, and then we're, we're going to come in to land with this. But um, there's a, a really interesting thing in this parable uh, that Pippa highlighted. It's a story, of course, of a family, and, and a family that could be seen to be quite dysfunctional. You have a son that won't recognize he's a son. He thinks he's a servant. But there's also the second son who refuses to recognize that his brother is his brother. He calls his brother, your son, talking to his father. But this is actually about a family coming together, isn't it? And about them learning to rejoice together. And the father wants both sons to rejoice with their different stories. And we're going to just take a moment to, um, to, to group um, and I just want you to, 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 to make a little group with people around you and they're probably not people that you came with because you've moved okay so we're going to do what we love doing once a month we're going to be brought ca cake and coffee and tea and for 10 minutes we're just as we finish we're just going to um, introduce ourselves and we are going to recognize in the person opposite a brother or sister Okay, and we're going to recognize that we are children of God together and you might want to just say where you come from what's your story but it's an opportunity very very simply to recognize each other and say we're family okay we're going to do that just for a short moment for five minutes it's an opportunity to say hello to someone you don't know but would you gather in your groups uh, of maybe sort of four or five people just say hello to them I, I know some people hate this but this is family and if you're here for the first time bear with us say hello to someone and if you're on your own join a group do sit down we're going to bring cake coffee tea to you so you can celebrate together and if there are no chairs bring some chairs up and let's just take five ten minutes to introduce ourselves to each other what's your story how come you're here what's your name where are you from brothers and sisters together And if you're following us online, why don't you just put in the chat your name, something of your story. You are welcome to. We are family. And this is home.
Okay, let's um, draw things together, can we? I know that was brief, but we can keep on talking afterwards. We're not quite finished yet, so would you like to take a seat? If you're in a, in a, a group, that's fine. Just turn to, perhaps to face me. You're looking, you're saying, no, Lucia, you want us to keep on talking, don't you? Yeah. Do, do sit down for a moment, if you're happy to, please. Let's gather together again if we can. Okay, can we, um, could you sit down so I can see which of the groups that have been listening and which haven't? Fantastic. Perhaps the group at the back there that are just wonderfully discussing. Can we gather together? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, just ha put your hand in the air if you met somebody you hadn't met before. That's great. That's great. Um, we want to just welcome everybody into the, into the Lord's family and um, some of us have been part of this church for a long time. Some of us have, uh, are perhaps here for the very first time, in which case you are really, really welcome. And I hope you were able to say hello to somebody today. And as you go out, please do pick up the welcome leaflet that we have. We also have scattered around on the tables the uh, program card for um, this period. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to find your place in our church. Um, we are learning to love one another. We're learning to welcome one another with all our differences. And uh, let's, why don't we learn to celebrate together as well, um, like the parable invited us to. One or two practical things, if I, if I may. Um, in, by way of notices, you will have received, hopefully, the notice sheet. Uh, do take that home with you. Uh, this week, there are one or two things that I would like to highlight. Uh, first of all, um, on Wednesday lunchtime, where is Tanya? Tanya, there you are. Um, what is the concert this week on Wednesday? Cellist and a pianist. Okay, they both study at the Royal Academy. What are they going to be playing? Just give us two or three names. You can't remember. No. It's on the poster. They're going to play music. All right. It's going to be great. Um, Wednesday here, one o'clock, cellist, pianist, and um, if you've been to any of these concerts in the past, you will know what a high standard it is and what a, an amazing time. So if you're able to come on Wednesday at one o'clock, that would be fantastic. Wednesday evening, we also have a meeting in here. It's the final one of our Lent series. We've been going through on a theme of uh, community under the, th under the title Life Together. And um, we are delighted to be able to welcome in this week, this Wednesday evening, Sam Wells. Sam is a prolific writer. He's also the vicar of St. Martin in the Fields. He's also a broadcaster. You may have heard him on the radio. Um, he will be um, reflecting on what it means for us to be community today um, as God's church and God's people. Please come at uh, 8 o'clock on, on Wednesday evening. That'll be a really good time. Looking further ahead, we have a moment where we are going to be able to celebrate as church. That is, Easter is coming up. Can you believe that Easter is in two weeks' time? And we have some invitation cards here that are scattered around on the tables, but also we have a whole load of them at the back of church just before you go out. Could I encourage you to take these with you? The idea is that you use them to remind yourself, of course, of what's going on, but also to invite 
uh, we will be having um, opportunities to invite people Monday, Thursday evening, Good Friday evening, uh, where we're going to have a fantastic musical uh, meditation on the cross through different pieces of music written by members of our church. Um, like the song actually we used earlier on, the second one in the worship slot, what was it called? That was written by you, Thomas. That one that talked about holy is the Lord, holy glory, whatever it was. Oh, I will worship until he comes, something like that. You wrote that. Um, but we're going to be using songs that, that our members of our church have written on the theme of the cross to meditate and listen to the readings. That will be on Good Friday evening. And then, of course, um, the, the moment, yes, the evening, uh, the moment that everybody waits for is the dawn service on Easter Day. Six o'clock in the morning, we gather around a fire in the garden and then we share breakfast together and it is awesome. And then we have a celebration for everybody at 10.30. All of that is here. And please take those and give them away as invitation cards to friends. Looking further ahead, we are reflecting on how we can build community. And we're going to invite you to do that this year because we are going to take part in FOCUS. And I'd like to just put on the very quick clip that we have, Paul, if we may, advertising FOCUS for this year if we can do that now. opportunity for churches together from across the network of HDB churches, Holy Trinity Brompton churches uh, that are linked with that and have been planted as we were 30 odd years ago. And uh, we would like to organize a group to go there and meet with others and celebrate. If that is interesting and to you and you're able to join us, then please find more information online. Final notice, I have some bands of marriage to read. And uh, we're going to pray for these couples. Let's, let me just read these and then we're going to pray before uh, we go on. I published the bands of marriage between Iron Jade Yem of this parish and James Alexander Johnson Trednick, also of this parish, and also between Virginia Ellen Blackburn of this parish and Justin Allen Urquhart Stewart of the parish of St. Saviour, Wendell Park, London. If any of you know a reason in law why these persons should not be married, please see me after the service. And this is for the second time of asking. Let's just pray for them, shall we? Lord, we pray for these couples. We thank you that you know them not only by name, but you know the depths of their hearts. And we pray that as they prepare for married life, you will come and walk alongside them. Draw them into your love, we pray, and bless them and strengthen them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. And we're going to have a blessing together before our final song. He says as he puts his coffee cup down. Let's receive our blessing from the Lord. May the God who calls us, who calls us into his love, who in Christ draws us to himself, and the God who renews us, who by his spirit gives us power to live. May this God now fill us with his blessing, with his peace, his love and his joy. He knows everything about us. He knows where we will be tomorrow. And so may he accompany us on the journey, enabling us to walk confidently as his children this week. Amen. Amen. Our final song, and then don't forget to remain to keep meeting people, but have a very, very good week. When all I see is the battle, 
You see my victory When all I see is the mountain You see a mountain move And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now For I am safe in you So when I fight I fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I'll lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, God. Oh, when all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. Oh, so when I fight, I fight on my Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. Stand against the power of our God oh, So when I fight, I fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you So when I fight, I Fight on my knees with my 